Knowledge in St. Edith Stein A Presentation on the Epistemic Philosophy of St. Edith Stein by Tessa Breen Knowledge is tied to human expression. To know is not only to experience, but to express one's experience to oneself. Epistemology may be understood to be a living study because it affects every person by asking the same immortal questions. What is knowledge? How does one come to know? Is knowledge merely a state of mind, or are there physical dimensions to it as well? If there are both mental and physical characteristics involved in knowledge, what is the relationship between the mind and body of the knowing subject? While the question of epistemology in general is a broad one, the focus of this lecture will be to analyze the philosophical proposal of St. Edith Stein's definition of knowledge who, in attempting to reconcile classic Thomistic thought with that of her phenomenological background, wrote that all knowledge is the act of the person. This is an interesting take on the question of epistemology, because it automatically assumes the role of human action as a necessary aspect of knowledge, which therefore means knowledge belongs in the realm of a combination of both metaphysical and material realities. I find having a more personal historical context in regards to the lives of the philosophers I study to be interesting but also beneficial in helping me to understand and have a fuller perspective of those things which influence their thoughts and writings. So I'm going to digress briefly here for a few moments to offer a few facts on St. Edith's life which I hope will offer my listeners an outermost framework for the rest of my presentation. Edith was born in 1891 to a Jewish family in Breslau, Germany. The youngest of seven children, she grew up with a great love for reading. She was remarkably intelligent, and according to her sister, had a tremendous memory even from the age of four. She started school at the age of six, which marked the beginning of what turned out to be a very fruitful and lifelong academic career. Edith studied psychology and philosophy at Breslau University, before going to Göttingen and focusing on phenomenology, where she also became acquainted with well-known phenomenologist philosophers, the foremost of which was Edmund Husserl. Though raised in the Jewish religion, Edith was an atheist until her twenty-first year, due to her inability to believe in the existence of God. However, the tragic death of her beloved professor, Adolf Reinach, on the battlefield during World War I, and the subsequent example of his wife, who accepted his death in a spirit of conformity and acceptance to the will of God, was pivotal for Edith. She later spoke of the impression this incident left upon her, saying, It was then that I first encountered the cross and the divine strength which it inspires in those who bear it. For the first time I saw before my very eyes the Church, born of Christ's redemptive suffering, victorious over the sting of death, it was at that moment in which my unbelief was shattered, Judaism paled, and Christ streamed out upon me. Christ in the mystery of the cross. Edith worked from 1916 to 1918 as Husserl's personal assistant at Freiburg University. In 1922, after an extraordinary encounter with the writings of St. Teresa of Avila, Edith was baptized into the Catholic Church. Although she desired to join a religious order, she was advised to continue her studies. So in 1923, she went to live with the Dominican sisters in Spire, where she lived and taught at their convent school. It was here that she became introduced to St. Thomas Aquinas. Discovering the angelic doctor was crucial for Edith, who later wrote, It was through St. Thomas that it first dawned on me that it was possible to pursue learning in the service of God, and not until then could I bring myself to go on again seriously with intellectual work. She resolved to reconcile the tension between the world of Thomistic thought and that of phenomenology. By 1931, Edith was translating St. Thomas's Questiones Disputatiae from Latin into German. In a letter written to a friend at this time, she attested the demanding nature of her work but perhaps even more importantly to the profound effect it was having on her soul. She wrote, St. 
St. Thomas is no longer satisfied with my spare time. He claims me entirely. Edith eventually accepted a position at the German Institute in Munster, but was terminated within a year due to the rise of anti-Semitism in Germany. Incidentally, it is from this short period of time in which she taught and lectured at Munster that her thoughts on the topic of knowledge were written, and which, accordingly, offer the foundation for this presentation. The book containing St. Edith's Reflections on Knowledge also contains a collection of some of her shorter writings, written between 1929 and 1933. Her definition of knowledge is taken from a series of lecture notes entitled Knowledge, Truth, and Being, which, as I mentioned, were specifically gathered from the time of her stay at Munster. In these notes, St. Edith speaks of the connection between knowledge and the person, as well as the relationship of knowledge in regards to truth and being. The fact that St. Edith includes truth and being in her discussion of knowledge highlights the importance of the respective roles she considers them to play, both of which, she implies, are interrelated with knowledge. Knowledge is worthless without resting on the firm foundation of truth, and it is being which provides the actual link connecting the two. It is worth noting here that in her writings, St. Edith distinguishes two types of beings, being as opposed to being. The former refers specifically to the individual as a material person, living and interacting with others, while the latter refers more broadly to the individual as a whole, a person who is known fully only to God. Note, the term being will be used synonymously in reference to person throughout the course of this discussion. Accordingly, it is not difficult to see that there is a sort of dynamic, almost Trinitarian connection in regards to St. Edith's concept of knowledge in its relation to truth and the person. St. Edith says knowledge on a fundamental level is the mental grasping of an object. In a strictly literal sense, it means grasping something that has not been grasped before. In an extended sense, it includes an original possessing without beginning, and a having in possession that goes back to grasping. While knowledge, therefore, is an intentional action wherein the person grasps at things unknown in order to know, it is a seemingly mysterious and elusive thing to understand, because as St. Edith says, it includes an original possessing without beginning. By this statement, St. Edith is referring to God, who possesses all knowledge, eternally, that is to say, without beginning, as opposed to humans. In regards to humans, St. Edith chooses to assume that the potential for knowledge is inherent within the person, though it essentially only exists in potency until being actualized through the action of the person. In regard to the person, or being, as she says, St. Edith's concept of knowledge inherently assumes the need for the action of a rational human being, a free agent, who is capable of voluntarily and intentionally grasping for things hitherto unknown or external to himself. St. Edith says this knowledge as newly grasping can in turn be taken in a broader and narrower sense. It has the broader sense when the perception stands for sense knowledge, and the narrower sense when the object of the knowledge is said to be states of affairs, or to appear first in judgment. This ties in with her theory of the dual dimension of the person, who is both being there for itself, and being open for what is other. In the former case, in being self-present to himself, the person grasps knowledge in the narrower sense by understanding himself, or his own states of affairs, and enacting his own judgments. In the latter case, the person grasps objects on a broader scale, and that his sense of being for what is other allows him to perceive the world and those other persons and objects within it. In this way, knowledge is seen to come both from within and without the person, which harmoniously serves to portray both the characteristics of the rational nature, intellect and will. For St. Edith, knowledge is a step-by-step -step ongoing process. It is interesting to see how this plays out, for it is in seeing beyond oneself that one comes to realize how much more there is for him to know or grasp 
which continually motivates him to seek to learn more. As Aristotle said, all men desire to know. In regards to knowledge and the person, St. Edith compares the finite ability to know to that of the infinite knowledge of God, in whom all knowledge exists. She refers to God as both pure act and absolute being, since, as she writes, he is everything that is, and the outside of which there is neither being nor beings. Everything that is, is in it, and is known in it. Hence, no being can be unknowable." End quote. Melissa Chastain, director of the Edith Stein Center at Spalding University, comments on this quote from Edith's work, saying, quote, Only the divine, who fully knows each being, may judge. For Stein, we will never have full knowledge of each other. Knowledge is a gift given to the individual, so that a person may acquire an understanding of the world. Yet knowledge is restricted by the being's temporal existence. Beings are always limited in the knowledge that they gain. They are limited by their temporal existence in the world. End quote. Essentially, God alone is the ultimate reality by whom all knowledge can and must be understood. In focusing her definition of knowledge around the existence and action of the person, St. Edith is essentially favoring a sort of personalism in her thought process. In holding that a person's way of being is internal in regards to himself and external in regards to others, as she expresses with her terms, being there for itself and being there for what is other, she is emphasizing the importance of both the individual and social aspects of personhood in relation to the acquisition of knowledge. In reference to this, Chastain also comments that, quote, being there through the person and being there for persons prevents us from building our knowledge on a purely subjective means. By relying on the other, our minds become objective in the types of knowledge that we gain. No one can ever have complete knowledge, and we are constantly building our knowledge as we learn from the other." End quote. In other words, St. Edith paradoxically implies that it is in knowing oneself that one comes to know the other, while it is in knowing the other that one truly comes to know oneself. The person exists not only as a person who is conscious of himself, but simultaneously as a person whose actions allow him to see beyond himself and so enter into an ongoing, lifelong, and hopefully educational relationship with others. For St. Edith, there is a definite reference to both the knower and the known in her understanding of knowledge as being the act of the person. Her definition also directly relates to a belief in the all-knowing God, who is absolute being and pure act itself. Despite the fact that St. Edith approaches the question of knowledge with the mindset of a phenomenologist, her philosophy in regards to the personal and action-based dimensions of knowledge are based on and supported by the scholastic tradition of philosophy. They actually specifically incorporate and rest upon basic to mystic and Aristotelian philosophical principles. Scholastic philosophy, according to D.Q. McInerney, makes up a significant portion of the perennial philosophy, which he writes has, quote, proven itself to be reliable with impressive constancy down through the centuries. It can be described as the sum total of all genuine philosophical truths, having their source in the East or West, which human history has bequeathed to us." End quote. While St. Edith presents her definition of knowledge as being the act of the person, and that knowledge leads to action, which first originated in the person, perhaps a better way to understand this is to look at it in the reverse, that there must be a person to act, and it is through this action that knowledge is reached. This way, the order essentially begins with the order of importance, the person, and so highlights the primordial fact that there must be a knowing subject in order for anything to be known at all. Since St. Edith bases her epistemology on classical and scholastic principles, we are now going to examine the Aristotelian and Thomistic philosophies in regards to the person and human action to see how she does this. In keeping with the rather more abstract nature of phenomenological terminology, as mentioned previously, St. Edith chooses to refer to the two characteristics which describe the person as being there for itself and being open for what is other. 
However, this actually corresponds to the more precisely stated Aristotelian principles that man is by nature a political, social animal, and secondly, that humans are the only animals with rational discourse. Since St. Edith holds that the person exists as present and conscious of himself, Aristotle's stipulation of rationality affirms her theory. On the other hand, her belief that the person also exists in relation to others likewise corresponds to Aristotle's stipulation in regards to the social dimension of the person as well. Based on his view of the human person, Aristotle believed all knowledge should begin with the senses, and St. Edith seems to assume this principle in, in her idea of the person as well. The difference, or rather the distinction here, is that St. Edith goes a step further back by focusing on the censor of the senses, the person as such. In this particular instance, while Aristotle focuses on the physical aspect of the person, namely his possession of a material body, St. Edith focuses on the spiritual aspect of the person in regards to his soul, that which makes the body a living person. Of course, this is not to say that Aristotle denies the existence of the, or the importance of the soul at all, for indeed it was he who categorized the human soul as rational. On the contrary, the point to note here is St. Edith's subtle integration of the distinctly personal dimension of knowledge, the idea which St. Thomas drew from Aristotelian philosophy in holding with the principle of the soul being the form of the body. While St. Edith's definition of knowledge revolves around the person, it in no way limits the person on the basis of either physical or cognitive ability. The person simply is, and as such always has the potential for knowledge, regardless of his individual limitations. Both Aristotle's and St. Edith's views are complementary in that they are essentially two sides of the same coin. For Aristotle, the individual cannot have senses with which to gain knowledge in the absence of a material body. For St. Edith, it is the possession of the spiritual soul which highlights the foundation of the human attainment of knowledge. The spiritual soul enlivens the material body, making the relationship, whether internally with himself or externally with the world, possible. Both the soul and the body, at least initially, necessitate the other. Human action plays a key role in St. Edith's concept of knowledge, for while she not only utilizes the classical understanding of the person, she also relies on St. Thomas's philosophy in regards to human action. The person is a composite union of body and soul. Accordingly, it follows that his manner of being in way of expression must reflect his possession of an intellect with which to think and a will with which to freely choose. St. Thomas says only those actions which are proper to man as man are deemed human. In the Summa Theologica, he writes that, quote, those actions alone are properly called human of which man is master. Now man is master of his actions through his reason and will. Therefore, those actions are properly called human which proceed from a deliberate will, End quote. Accordingly, for an action to be human, the action must be intentional and voluntary in regards to the person. But what makes a person engage in this intentional and voluntary type of action, this action which is so distinctly human? What is the underlying principle which motivates human action? St. Thomas holds that man acts out of the desire for a final end, which always leads to some sort of perfection or fulfillment, for the object of the will is the end and the good and humans only act out of a desire for something which they perceive as good. Besides this fact, what is it that actually motivates the person to act at all, or to see the good as desirable? St. Thomas says that the underlying motivation for all human action is the pursuit and acquisition of happiness, by which he means that that perfection or fulfillment which accompanies the desiring of something for its own sake. The concept of man's final end being the attainment of happiness, explains on what basis the person deliberates and judges. St. Thomas clarifies that happiness does not fully consist of any created good, but rather is, quote, the perfect good, which lulls the appetite altogether, else it would not be the last end, if something yet remained to be desired. Now the object of the will, i.e. of man's appetite, is the universal good, just as the object of the intellect is the universal good. 
This is to be found not in any creature, but God alone, because every creature has goodness by participation. End quote. Consequently, at the end of the day, man acts by means of his intellect and will for the sake of attaining happiness, the final end of which is God. In light of her adherence to Aristotle's philosophy of the person, St. Edith also makes use of the Thomistic scholastic philosophy in regards to that which renders actions human. However, St. Edith approaches the question of man's final end not so much by means of the happiness route, per se, but rather on the basis of the relationship between knowledge and truth. For St. Edith, the honest human desire for knowledge necessitates that the person's desire for truth guide his actions in leading him to the source of all knowledge, truth itself. While the philosophies of both Saints Thomas and Edith approach the question of human action from different angles, they nevertheless arrive at the same final end, God. St. Thomas says that, quote, everyone desires the fulfillment of their perfection, and it is precisely this fulfillment in which the last end consists, end quote. In other words, for St. Thomas, man's final end ultimately rests in the perfect happiness of the beatific vision, a fact with which St. Edith would most definitely agree with, since perfect knowledge is synonymous with perfect happiness, and both can only be fully realized in God. So, although St. Thomas bases the concept of man's intentionality on the principle that man's ultimate desire is for happiness, St. Edith's theory reaches this same conclusion, but by means of a different route, that of knowledge. While St. Thomas built upon the Aristotelian foundation that knowledge begins with the senses, this classical scholastic view was challenged in the Middle Ages with the notion of the mind-body problem which subsequently introduced the dualistic idea that, one, since the senses can be deceptive, they are not a sure foundation on which to base knowledge, and two, that knowledge must be certain in order for it to be real. With this school of thought came the depreciation of the body in favor of a glorification of the mind, most notably hallmarked by René Descartes' Cogito Ergo Sum proclamation, which posited self-thought to be the foundation of existence. In introducing his philosophy of doubt, Descartes concluded that he could only be certain of the existence of his mind. In his meditations, he writes, quote, I am therefore precisely nothing but a thinking thing, that is, a mind, or intellect, or understanding, or reason, words of whose meanings I was previously ignorant. Yet I am a true thing, and am truly existing. But what kind of a thing? I have said it already, a thinking thing. End quote. Descartes believed himself to be a thinking thing whose existence relies on metaphysical as opposed to physical proof. This is affirmed later in the Meditations when he writes, quote, For since I know that even bodies are not, properly speaking, perceived by the senses or by faculty of imagination, but by the intellect alone, and that they are not perceived through their being touched or seen, but only through their being understood, I manifestly know that nothing can be perceived more easily and more evidently than my own mind." End quote. Despite the widespread acceptance of Descartes' skeptical philosophy, which earned him the title of Father of Modern Philosophy, St. Edith directly bypasses the mind-body problem by indirectly assuming the Aristotelian and Thomistic principles which Descartes rejected. Her definition runs counter to the Cartesian concept of knowledge, by affirming the role which the senses play in the harmonious relationship of the material body and the rational mind, both of which she considers necessary for knowledge. Her concept of the co-importance of the self-awareness and other awareness of the person implies the classical scholastic basis for understanding the person and his epistemic ability as well. However, Although St. Edith did not personally respond to the Cartesian mind-body problem, another phenomenologist, Maurice Merleau-Ponty, did. In his book, entitled Phenomenological Perception, which was published in 1945, which was just three years after St. Edith's death, Merleau-Ponty rejected Cartesian dualism by pointing out that one cannot separate 
the certainty of his own thought from the certainty of his own perceptions. Thus, the genuine cogito is the cogito of action, since the realization that I am cannot be deduced from the realization that I think. According to Merleau-Ponty, the certainty of I think rests on the prior existential realization that I am. Merleau-Ponty would agree with St. Edith's theory that knowledge is a step-by-step -step action of mental grasping, since it incorporates the person's inherent ability to perceive. Accordingly, Merleau-Ponty's belief that the person acts intentionally on the basis of his perception supports St. Edith's theory that knowledge can only result from the action of the integrated person. As regards the mind-body problem, St. Edith subscribes to the Thomistic idea that there exists within the rational soul a sort of marriage between the mind and object, the object of which, for the purposes of this discussion, generally, generally refers to the human body. This union is essential because the person does not exist as a mind apart from the body, or a body apart from the mind. Particularly for St. Edith, this fact is important because action leading to knowledge presupposes its origination of an integrated person. While functions of either the mind or the body may be more or less actualized or perfected in a given person, it is the immortal soul which gives form to the body. While Descartes' philosophy resulted in constructing a sort of internal dichotomy between the mind and body of the individual person, later philosophers took this dichotomy to a whole new level by severing the person from all contact with the external reality of human interaction itself. Though Descartes' vision in proposing the philosophy of doubt was not meant to provide the stimulus for the extreme doubt and skepticism to which much of contemporary philosophy has been reduced, in rejecting foundational traditional principles built on the basis of logic and reason, it is not surprising that so much philosophical thought has since raised more questions than answers. How can I know anything? I can't rely on my senses, or my experiences, or my interactions with others. Can I trust my mind? What is the mind anyway? While Descartes attempted to use the mind to find a way to prove reality, the mind has since been used to cut people off from reality by treating the mind as a prison from which there is no escape. McInerney writes that, quote, the process by which we know the world in which we live, it should be evident that if human knowledge is anything, it is a radically relational phenomenon. Ideas do not imprison us within ourselves. They free us from ourselves. A trinity manifests itself in all human knowledge. There is the knower, there is the knowledge itself, and there is the thing which is known. The idea of the marriage between the mind and body offers a practical approach for understanding how human knowledge actually works. As sensing creatures, humans rely on the data of their five senses to perceive, abstract, and understand. Yes, the senses can deceive, but while we can be deceived by our senses, our experience tells us that this is not the norm. So, while we should not place unreserved confidence in the senses, we should not throw the baby out with the bathwater. This is where the epistemic notion of knowledge being justified true belief comes in. As rational creatures, we should be able to determine, without too much mental effort, what is the baby from what is the bathwater. It is in this sense that St. Edith's idea of knowledge is possible. It must be the action of the whole person, composed of body, mind, and soul. In retrospect, in using classical and scholastic meanings in her definition of knowledge, St. Edith does not forego her phenomenological tendencies, but rather endeavors to reconcile both methods of thought. The perennial philosophical tradition had not been the focus of her studies prior to her conversion, but St. Edith, eager as she was for the truth, readily learned, embraced, and incorporated it into her philosophy as well. Although the study of knowledge is a continuous process, St. Edith's epistemic philosophical thoughts offer a valid approach. Seeking truth ought to be the goal of philosophy, 
and St. Edith Stein's witness to the truth cannot be forgotten, for it was her love of truth which led to her death in 1942. After her termination at Munster, her real dream was finally realized with her acceptance into the Cologne Carmel. In an attempt to protect her from the Nazis, St. Edith, given the name Sister Teresa Benedict of the Cross, was transferred to a convent in Holland in 1938. However, in reprisal for the Dutch bishop's public condemnation of racism and anti-Semitism in 1942, the Nazis arrested and deported all Jewish Catholics in Holland. St. Edith was among those taken and was put to death a few weeks later at Auschwitz. Indeed, her journey in pursuit of truth climaxed at the time of her martyrdom, due not only on account of her ancestral heritage, but more specifically because of her conviction to the faith which she had embraced at her baptism ten years before. While no philosopher may be said to hold the standard on epistemic study and definition, there nevertheless exists the continual need to plumb its depths, for truth matters. St. Edith Stein offers a philosophical approach to epistemology, which offers a worthwhile and valid contribution to the overall study, particularly in that it is able to incorporate philosophical ideas which have spanned the whole history of philosophy, from the classical to contemporary periods. St. Edith Stein, also known as Sister Teresa Benedict of the Cross, was canonized by Pope John Paul II on October 11, 1998. During his homily at the canonization mass, he said, For a long time, Edith Stein was a seeker. Her mind never tired of searching, and her heart always yearned for hope. She traveled the arduous path of philosophy with passionate enthusiasm. Eventually, she was rewarded. She seized the truth. Or better, she was seized by it. Then she discovered that truth had a name, Jesus Christ. From that moment on, the incarnate word was her one and all. May that be truly said of each of us. Thank you for listening.